Hello, welcome to another episode of Our Time. Today I'm joined with Professor Maleski and my special guest, Arata. Um, Professor, you're very well known um, in civil rights. Um, you grew up in a black community um, in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Um, can you speak a, b a little bit on that? How was it growing up over there? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for having me on the show. Um, uh, yeah, it was interesting, um, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, 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 some some people may some of your viewers may know a little bit more about Boston than others, but uh, most people might remember, you know, that that Boston has had not the best time with race all the time. Uh, has had issues uh, uh, concerning you know race and so forth. Uh, mostly, uh, it's a lot of interesting reasons for that, and I, I write about this stuff, so I kind of have a sense of why. Um, but but. One of the biggest reasons is, uh, has to do with uh, something that took place in the 1970s in Boston, which was known as busing um, or school desegregation. Um, and uh, Boston had had a long, hard struggle with uh, uh, educating all of its citizens, all of its students. And so uh, if you went to a black school, or predominantly black school, I should say, like in Roxbury, um, uh, which is where many of them were located because that was the sort of, that is still the heart of the black community in Boston. Um, you'd notice that the schools were in bad, you know, in disrepair. Uh, you know, leaks from the roofs, uh, uh, you know, just terrible facilities. And, and more importantly than that even is no resources, no textbooks, no pencils, no pens, no uh, notebooks or paper even. Um, and so, uh, there was a lawsuit filed by the parents and students uh, in, the, in, the, in the, really what is our civil rights movement in Boston. The NAACP chapter in Boston branch uh, got involved and um, uh, sued the city and the city lost. Um, and the courts decided that uh, they found the city of Boston guilty of maintaining two separate segregated school systems essentially. Um, and so they started busing kids from Roxbury, the heart of the black community, to places like South Boston or Charlestown, um, neighborhoods which, if you knew Boston, if you know those areas, were, you know, strong ethnic white neighborhoods, essentially, um, who kept things kind of closed. <laughs> uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't even, like, really walk around there and stuff, like, say, after dark, if you were a person of color in the time that I grew up. Um, and so you can imagine that caused a lot of like polarization and a lot of turbulent stuff. And uh, there's a lot of footage out there. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the movie The Departed or any of the, some of the Hollywood movies. But uh, you 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 know they have a beginning sequence in the beginning of that movie The Departed where uh, you you see you know people throwing rocks at the school buses and stuff. So so I I kind of came along after all that um, and being a guy who's sort of like you know racially mixed was was interesting to say yeah, the least. That, that definitely was interesting. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about like President Trump's refusal to condemn the hate groups. Um, how does that add racial division to America? Yeah, I don't know if I guess wants to take that Nika one. could start. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it's important. Uh, you know, the, the, the president, whoever the president is, I don't, you know, in this case, our current president, um, has a very sort of unique approach to things and a very strong personality and a sort of strong way of doing things. Mm -hmm. and, and has shown, we have a historical record for this here in New York. I mean, we know, we know uh, Trump probably better than anyone else in the country. Um, and, um, uh, but, but whoever the president is and whatever their personality is and, and even whatever their way of doing things is, is uh, it's important for there to be a leader someone who um, can, can kind of set the example, right, for everyone else, or at least um, inspire us to reach higher or to, to think higher and to, and to um, achieve, you know, a higher level of, of doing things. Um, and that's why it's important for a president. I don't care who the president is or what their ideology is. Uh, anyone who is in that office, right, uh, to 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 sort of set things right and to and to make a distinction between what's right and wrong, 
The problem now is that we have the exact opposite of that. We have, we have someone who, is, um, who does not show the same sort of reverence for the office of the presidency, right? And that's, that's, that's hard for many Americans to accept because if you love this country, um, you also have sort of a natural respect for the Oval Office, for the, for the, for the office of, you know, the, 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 the trappings of the presidency, all of it, you know. Um, and, and so the irony is that, you know, you have a president who's criticizing people for not respecting things like the flag and so forth, but does it, doesn't uphold the democratic ideals upon which this country is based. And one of those things is uh, we don't uh, condone hatred. We don't condone um, hate speech. We're better than that. And so we're having a debate right now about what America is. If you want to take it back to a place or to a time where those things were condoned, um, then that's, that's a very specific program. But that's not the direction that most of the country, I think, wants to uh, go in. And, and this is why uh, that's, that's just a very hard pill to swallow for, most, um, for Americans who love this country. Yeah, that is oh, very true. I want to add on. So I agree with you, and I think like America is a whole. Like there's people from different parts of the country, um, and I feel like whoever, like you said, it doesn't matter who's in the office, but like they should emphasize that diversity and they should be open-minded to anyone and everyone. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what true. makes this country great is our diversity. It always has. I mean, I, we can you can find much more historical evidence to support that than these other perspectives that are being pushed right now. And I wanted to touch more on the civil rights. Um, recently, President Trump met with um, Kanye West, and I wanted to ask, do you feel like his relationship with Kanye um, was in a piece to Trump's support to African Americans? Sound like you have something to... I don't agree with him, but um, I don't know. I don't think... I feel like Kanye is kind of doing it on his own. Like he's kind of reaching out to Trump and like showing his support for him. And it's just that they get along. If he sees it as a way for African Americans to kind of like, to kind of like um, be the face to represent African Americans, then I guess that's a benefit that comes with it. But I feel like Kanye is really like, you know, a big supporter. Yeah, I actually agree. I agree. I think, I think this is, that's a lot of this is coming from him personally. Mm -hmm. I think, um, but you know, again, there's historical precedent for this. Um, you know, Nixon, who President Trump is reminding a lot of people of these days, uh, his his administration, I should say, um, you know, had had uh, James Brown, uh, you know, come to the to the to the White House, and, and and James Brown was somebody who, I mean, James Brown sang a song called "I'm Black and I'm Proud," you know, and it was an anthem for like the Black Power movement and and civil rights. And so to have someone like James Brown go to meet with President Nixon at that time was kind of like the closest thing I, in my mind to, to this. Um, because Kanye, first of all, if you like hip hop, if you're a Kanye fan, you're just, you know, you're heartbroken. Yeah. <laughs> I've been heartbroken. I don't know. I was a fan. I am a fan, I, I suppose, of, of the musical and the art. But, but uh, in this case, um, you know, it, it happens. It happens. It happens where... Um, African Americans who, um, you know, are uh, who, you know, who, you know, it's it's a sign in some ways of the social conservatism of African Americans, of which that is a that is a, a major feature of our politics. Um, and even though African Americans have historically voted, say, for the Democrats and stuff, uh, socially, um, there are some different feelings about various issues that may surprise some people. And so I have no problem with uh, Kanye West. Um, you know, sort of expressing and airing his views. Mm -hmm. It's a free country, you know. Freedom of speech. Freedom, freedom of speech. Opinion. He's an artist. You, you know, but a, we, a lot of people just respectfully disagree. And, um, and I respectfully disagree. I, I think that um, you, you know, you have an influence, you have a, a sort of power in terms of as an artist, and to try to leverage that to speak for African Americans as a whole mm -hmm. is problematic, especially when you have not done the research. You know, Kanye is a very smart individual, just naturally, he's genius, actually, artistically. But I don't know, and he has no excuse. You know, his mother was a professor of African American studies. And, and so it's, it's outrageous on so many levels um, and hurtful 
to those of us who sort of like you know want to support it, but but it's not unprecedented, and 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 this happens. Uh, we have a, a tradition of black conservatism, and I didn't know Kanye West was a was a black conservative, but well, hey. I, now we know. <laughs> well, I think that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank Professor Molesky. I'd like to thank, thank Professor Gessarada for coming. And thank you. Thank you.